Let's jump into backup and replication. I think this is the most fun to me of all the different topics we can talk about. Not so much the backup side, because I mean, let's be honest, who has fun talking about backups? But replication, love it. I've always had this great uh, feel for when I walk into a room and I ask, how are, how's the DR project, or how comfortable do we feel with our backups and, and restores? When I see their faces, I can tell either one, They've had a major meltdown recently and lost data, or they haven't planned for DR. No, they should have, and their manager keeps asking them, but they haven't done it. Um, and that's gone on for like six years now. It's always a fun conversation because there's so much that you have to take in and keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> what's the most important thing about a replication project or a disaster recovery project? A lot of people will answer me and say, the most important thing is making sure that all of your data is available at the DR site. And I would have to say, wrong. That is a great thing to have. You might, you know, you might feel like the hero when the disaster recovery site comes back online, but when two weeks later or a month later when the facility is rebuilt or you got all the water out of the data center because of flooding, and you're ready to move back to production, and you have to tell your manager that it's going to be another three days or a week to get your data migrated from the DR site back to production, you're not going to be having a good day that day. That's the day when they all go, what? Because I guarantee you that none of management or, uh, or the leadership team has thought about taking downtime to come back from DR to the corporate campus or to the, to the main campus. So. What is great about Hyper-V 2012 is the ability to do backups and replication built right into the product. All you have to do is right-click on a virtual machine and kick up rep. You can do planned um, failovers. You can do a failover from one site to another. You can do seeded where you take a you use a sneaker, sneaker net where you back up the VM to a, a removal device, send it to your DR site, restore it, and then start just moving over the changes. Um, all of those pieces are baked into Hyper-V 2012, and that comes with it. There's no add-on software needed. Um, <clears throat> I'll walk you through the demo here in just a second. Uh, the first part of the demo, we'll talk about backups that uh, installed and configured, um, and then we'll kick over and talk about replication. So uh, with that, let's roll back to the small office and, and do that demo. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and jump into backups first. Uh, Hyper VDI 02 server, I have it out sitting out here at the uh, 1.9 IP address. What I want to do is add a role or feature. I want to go ahead and add that Windows Server Backup feature. So let's right click, do Add Role or Feature, Role Based or Feature Based Installation, and click Next. Choose the Hyper VDI 02 server. So we're going to do a remote install uh, with the new server manager capabilities. Click Next and we won't need anything on the roles page but on the features page we want to scroll down and choose Windows Server Backup. So basically we're going to install this particular feature uh, and on the remote server which is VDI02. So I'll go ahead and hit next and install. It's going to go out and do that since we already have uh, on VDI01, we already have the Windows Server Backup uh, accessible because I've already got it installed and running. Let's flip over and talk about that now. Now, if you haven't got a, an icon set up, what you'll want to do is go to your start screen, type in Windows or Backup or Server. It will automatically find that for you. Right click and pin to start or pin to the taskbar, whatever you're used to using, uh, so that it's there and available. Okay. So back at the main screen, we're going to basically look at a local backup. We're going to look at the backup schedule. Um, so I've already, cre I've already pre-created this schedule, but I'm going to walk through it anyway. So we're going to go modify backup. I'm doing a custom backup. Now we could do a full server backup, um, but in this case I want to show off the capabilities of backing up a virtual machine more than anything else. So I go ahead and click next, and um, I hit add items then I can dive into the Hyper-V section. If I look at, the, at this particular server, I look at the Hyper-V section, I can see Tier 1 app, I can see all the virtual machines available. Now you'll notice that some of them say online, and some of them say offline. Now, why is that? What that means is the Volume Shadow Copy Service has to be running and, and op fully operational. 
in order to take an online backup of a virtual machine uh, without taking it down and whatnot. Every time that the backup runs, basically the machine is quiesced with a snapshot and <clears throat> we were a checkpoint, I should say, now in R2, and we go from there. Well, if let's say Tier 1 app. Now we know that Tier 1 app, based on the live migration demo, is actually a DOS machine running an old game that we all know and love. Well, DOS doesn't have volume shadow copy servers, so it does not have the capability of being backed up um, you know, online. So it says offline, and that basically is fine with me. So I'm going to hit, go ahead and leave these two selected, Tier 1 app and, and uh, Client 1. And I'm going to go into Next. I've got where I can choose my schedule. I've already got it set to go at 5.30 every morning. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. I'm going to back up to a volume. Now you could back up to an entire hard disk. This would actually format the hard disk um, uh, and, and have it set up for backups only. Back up to a volume lets me back up to a specific disk drive but not wipe out the contents. So it'll just use a folder on that drive. Or I can back up to a shared network folder, uh, which would probably be ideal. Um, probably a deduplication uh, enabled Windows Server 2012 file share would be a great place to put your backups. So go ahead and hit next. I'm going to keep my current backup destination, but I'm going to hit modify just to show you. So when you hit add, you basically get to look at all the different drives that are out there. I've already chosen the uh, the E drive here. So I'm going ahead and hit next. I'm going to choose and use space and size. Looks good. Everything looks fine. Um, I'm not excluding any files from the backups. And I'm going to go ahead and hit finish. All right, since we already had that schedule, um, we can see now that my backup is running, creating shadow copies of volumes as we speak. Um, any problems that happen, I'll be able to go in and look at those. But uh, this is how uh, the backups are ran. And if we want to go look at that particular E drive, uh, we should see where things are starting to back up when, once they do. Um, we'll kind of come back to this in a minute. But for right now, let's go ahead and jump into Replica and talk about replication. Uh, so we don't have a lot of time for this demo, and I want to make sure we cover everything we can. All right, so now I'm back in Hyper-V. First things first, we need to talk about how we enable Hyper-V uh, to do replication. So Hyper-V settings, let's go in, Hyper-V settings. Now, we skipped over this feature uh, when we were talking earlier through the main settings page, so let's go ahead and jump into this. Um, first thing I want to point out is the default port is set to 80. I don't like this. I like changing that to something that may not get stepped on. So, for instance, you install IIS. Well, what happens? Port 80 is automatically in use somewhere else, right? I don't like that being there, so I like to change my port. Um, and also, if you go on virtuallycloud9.com, you'll see a, uh, a guide to how you can manage the or throttle the, uh, the network speed that's being used. And um, basically what I do is I throttle that specific port. Uh, that way I'm not interfering with the entire server's operations on the network uh, or um, slowing down any of the client machines. I'm actually slowing it down on a per port basis uh, during the day and then letting it run full throttle at night. So that's how I've uh, kind of worked through that. Um, I use Kerberos HTTP. Uh, you can use certificate-based authentication and that's obviously the more secure way of doing things. Uh, so that's there. And if we look at the bottom, let me zoom in on this. We get to put where do we want to set up the replication to take place? What volume am I using? I can also, if I wanted to, choose which servers are allowed to replicate to this particular server. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that today. I'm allowing anything, which is the default. Any servers can replica, uh, create replicas on this main server. So I've set up the VM replicas folder. Um, and I've told it that it is uh, able to participate in replication. Also, if you remember, um, before any of this will work, um, I went ahead and turned on the delegation uh, in Active Directory <coughs> for these different servers to be able to replica to this particular server. So VDI-02 is going to be able to replica to VDI-01. Um, make sure you don't forget the delegation uh, part. Okay, So I'll go ahead and click uh, <coughs> Escape out of that. And we're but we're basically fine here. So I can cancel. Now what I want to do is look at client one. 
Notice that it says backing up out to the right. That means I'm running a backup on that particular machine, which is great. I want to go look at my replica settings, though. Um, <clears throat> notice that I already had this guy started. Now, what's great about this is I can do a planned failover, um, except for I can't do that while a machine is running. Okay, so think about your disaster recovery process. You can't do uh, a failover when a machine is actually running at your primary site. So what I'll do is, if I wanted to run through this failover process, I would shut down client one. I could also pause replication if I'm doing some maintenance or I know that my link is going to be down. I can look at the replication health. Now I love this feature. Uh, basically what this does is it tells me what's the average size, what's the maximum size, and what's the average latency and how many times it's been successful, but I love this one. Why? Because that's how I can determine just what kind of pipe size I might need uh, at my DR site or where I'm doing my replication to. So, um, you know, I tell people a lot of times, they say, well, I don't know how much, how much is changing inside of my virtual machine, so how can I set up replication? Well, basically, go set up a Hyper-V server right next to the same primary server in the data center. All right? Turn on replication. Watch it throughout the day. Watch that report. Maybe save the report off and look at it later. That tells you what your maximum data change size is. We're not too concerned about the network bandwidth at that point. We just want to know what's changing uh, disk-wise on that particular server. So, good way of doing that. <clears throat> we can also see the last time it synchronized. Um, I can reset the statistics and I can save this as well. So we'll go ahead and hit close. Now, how do we get client one as a replica in the first place? Hey, look at that. Notice my backup jobs have already finished. We'll flip back over to that in a bit. If I right click on uh, a machine that's not being replicated yet, I can click on enable replication. And basically what I have to do is feed it a server. Which server do I want it to go to? In this case, I want to replicate this machine. This is on VDI-01. Let's replicate to VDI-02. It goes and verifies. It says, hey, we're going to use port 9999. That's the one that I chose. Um, use Kerberos. And we're going to compress the data that is tr transmitted over the network. That's by default checked, OK? We hit Next. This is where I can choose which hard drives I want to replica. Now, this is gets into, uh, you know, do I need to replicate the, the C drive all the time or the D drive all the time? Maybe you've got some page file disks that don't need to be replicated because you're just going to recreate those on the fly um, at your DR site. That's all fine. Um, just choose which virtual hard drives you need to make sure to get to that DR site. Click on configure replication frequency. This is how often I want it to work. So every 30 seconds is the, uh, the fastest method available. 5 minutes or 15 minutes. 15 minutes probably fine for my lab. Go to next. Maintain only the latest recovery point. Now I can open it up to where it will maintain more recovery points. Coverage provided by additional recovery points in hours. I could say let's make sure we have recovery points every 8 hours. Volume shadow copy service, snapshot frequency. How often does that run? And I can make that even more granular. Okay, So this is built right in. Then I can hit next. Now, this is the really intriguing piece. Do I want to ascend the initial copy over the network, or do I want to seed the destination? Um, you know, this was basically you, you take you a, a, a external hard drive or a, a way of getting that data off site uh, physically. So you take and you, you copy the main machine, so you'll send the initial copy to an external drive. Then we'll call it sneaker netting across town to the DR site, or we could send it over, you know, next day air or whatnot. Have it plugged into that to that destination server, and then you can go ahead and pull it in from there and set up replication. What's great now is the only thing that has to be replicated across the wire are the changes that have happened since that initial export occurred. Right? We can also set it up. So let's say. You've got a virtual machine, the replication got broken somehow, or you had to do DR and you had to rebuild your primary site, um, but you went ahead and restored from backup. You can use existing virtual machines on the replica server as the initial copy. That way, you don't have to start over. So if you say use an existing machine, then you can set that piece up. It will look for the name. It will match up and say, OK, let's go ahead and start over. And it will look through 
and see which blocks have changed, which blocks have not changed, and only send over the pieces that need to be sent over. So a little quicker way of doing things uh, in the event that you need to start over with replication as a process, but not necessarily as a full-blown data move. So uh, when do we want this to happen? Start replication immediately, or I can tell it to start at a certain time. I like everything I see. It's going to give me a summary, and that is how you set up a replica. Also in R2, the ability to set up a third replica. Uh, for sake of time, I'm going to jump back over to client zero, client one, and go look and see if I have. Do I have any checkpoints? I do not. But fear not, checkpoints do not stop backups from running, nor do they stop replication from running. So that's a really big thing um, that used to really bite me when I was doing uh, consulting with VMware. Um, is I would set up backup jobs to run, and some of those different backup products. Um, just didn't like having that snapshot, another snapshot out there that wasn't belonging to the backup process or the replication process. We don't have to worry about that in Hyper-V. Uh, the checkpoints don't get involved as much. Okay, so uh, that is replica. Let's jump back over to our backups. Everything went good, so we got a successful backup, and we can go look at the details of that, and it shows how it how it backed up. What was the data size? All right, so. 12 gig, so for client one's a 12 gig machine. Um, looks like everything backed up to the E drive, and we can go look at a list of backup files and where it was, where they went to. Okay. There's the there's the configuration files, virtual hard disk, memory. Make it click OK. And we can go look at uh, the backups themselves. So if you look at it, you'll see Windows Image Backup. And we'll see Hyper VDI 01. So it created this folder for us. And here's the backup dates. We can go look through the catalog if we wanted to. And there's the disk. Server or a backup stored in another location. So I can just say on this server, 530. Yeah, that's the, that's the one we want. Files and folders, or Hyper-V. So Hyper-V, you can restore virtual machines, right? That's what we want. So we're going to click on Hyper-V, and I'm going to drill down and see that I have Tier 1 and Client 1 available. I can click on Tier 1, recover to the original location, or recover to an alternate location. I'm going to choose recover to an alternate location. Let's go out and browse. I'm just going to go put it on a in a temp directory. So let's make a new folder. Restore temp. Click OK. Next. And recover. So it's going out. It's going to go out and recover that particular machine. It's initializing now. Remember, the best thing about a backup is if it can recover or not. So never, uh, never assume that things are working well. And by recovering to a different place, we have the ability to test. All right, so it's completed. Let's go ahead and go take a look and see what we see in Hyper-V Manager. Okay, so the recovery process is finished. Let's go look now at Tier 1 app. I see it listed on Hyper-V DI01. Let's go ahead and go look at that guy and look at the settings on it. And let's go ahead and drill into where the hard disk is. Notice where it is. There it is, folks. It's in that restore temp folder. It's already there, mounted, ready for me to uh, kick it up and see how things run. So let's go ahead, right click, start. You see it booted up just fine. I can go into uh, Duke 1, and there we go. There's Duke Nukem ready to go fight the world by the evil again. So, hope you enjoyed the demo, folks, and we'll throw it back to the presentation. Well, that brings us to our last 25 minutes of fun together, everybody. And we have a topic that Tommy and I could spend eight hours on trying to go through. So in this section, I want to introduce it, and I'll demo it a little bit. I want to kind of give you an idea of, of what we look like from a system center spac, uh, uh, stack, uh, where that all kind of plays in, and then also where does VMM sit in, uh, into that stack as well. So with that, let's go ahead and get rolling. And once again, remember, we talked earlier about which tools provide some of the free access or things that we can do for our core structure. You can build 
uh, a majority of your virtualization environment with a lot of the free tools. But when you want to get into some of the, the more enhanced techniques around uh, VM templates uh, and, and, and creating things more automati uh, automatically, I should say, uh, bare host deployment, uh, some of the virtual networking stuff, um, uh, load balancing uh, with uh, di dynamic optimization and, and power optimization. Uh, VMM is not only the tool that does it, but it's also VMM that gives you that functionality. So it's stuff that is not built into Windows Server or Hyper-V Server. Um, it's it's functionality that you're going to get. So it, when you see those big yeses on the right-hand side, it's it's not only is that the tool that manages it, it's a tool that also introduces those features uh, into our environment. So when we look at System Center for our data centers, there's, there's lots of components to make up uh, System Center. There's lots of different products that all fa fall under the System Center brand that we have. Uh, the first one, uh, the, the one that we're going to spend some time with in a moment, is the Virtual Machine Manager. And we'll talk more about that later. But it's designed to manage your virtualization environment, as well as your private cloud, and even has hooks into your public cloud environment. One of the nice things about VMM is it's designed to not only manage uh, Hyper-V, it's also designed to manage Citrix Zen servers and, and VMware uh, vCenters and, v, uh, and, and VMware servers as well. So we have that ability to do those types of things to kind of give you that. If, you, if you're running both environments and you're kind of that hybrid deployment, VMM might be that tool to help you uh, manage both. Uh, on top of this, when we think about our virtualized environments and we think about um, what we do from an IT perspective, it's not always just about our servers. I mean, I'd love to say that IT is 100% is about my server, but when I stand up a server, it's not really doing anything. Uh, that server needs an app, uh, some kind of application. That app could be something that we do, like Active Directory or DNS or DHCP or file and web print services, or it could be an application that's mission critical for your company. It might be something that makes all the money. It might be your construction project planning application. Generally speaking, when we let people into our virtual machine environment, we don't want to give them Hyper-V Manager uh, or vClient. We, we want to give them some kind of portal that lets them come into it. That's App Controller. App Controller for essentially provides a self-service portal that allows uh, the people that want to leverage, maybe your developers uh, or people in testing uh, in the research department, uh, to leverage and create uh, virtual machines using your environment. And that's also where you can put quotas on them, you can put uh, uh, bill back, things like that. But App Controller is kind of that portal that allows people to come in and build off your uh, virtualized environment. Then we have the other components. I'm just going to build them out fairly quickly so you can see it. You have Operations Manager. This is uh, System Center SCOM for short. I liked its original name, which was MOM, because um, you know I don't know about you, but my mom saw everything I did, even if I didn't think she could see what I was doing. Well, think about Operations Manager. SCOM can actually do those types of things for your entire environment. It can, it can look what's going on uh, and help provide that. Then we have two other tools that kind of work in conjunction with each other, and that's Service Manager. And really, the whole system center, by the way, works all well in parallel. I always think of the whole system center suite as uh, the Voltron robot. You know, in, in and of themselves, the individual robots were really, really cool and pretty powerful, and they could do things. But when you put them together, you got this sort of power. You got this giant robot that could defeat uh, whatever you wanted to do. And that's kind of how system center works. But these two tools are really closely tied to the hip. You have Service Manager. Now, you might know Service Manager as a ticketing software, and that's what it is. But let's be clear on what I mean by a ticket, because you might be thinking, well, ticket, somebody forgot the password, and I have to track them through the support system, um, and so on, and yada, 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 whatever happens there. But what if a ticket was, um, that hard drive is running in a hard drive space, I need to move the running virtual workloads off of that machine to another host, and then uh, send an email off to the administrator saying we need a hard drive, or that hard drive is failing, or the hard drive is clicking. Service Manager it will handle those types of tickets that can also be fully automated as well. Imagine if SCOM detected an error or somewhere in your infrastructure. SCOM could actually provision the ticket inside of Service Manager, and Service Manager could proceed to handle that ticket in an automated fashion, or it could be the ticket sends alerts to administrators to go uh, run and check the blinky lights on your servers or whatnot. Underneath the covers, who does all the automated work inside of our environment? It's Orchestrator. Uh, Orchestrator is one of those tools that, 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 that I will tell you is quite frankly easy to use. Um, from a standpoint, it's, it's very easy to drag things on and create the workflow, but that's essentially what it's doing. It's creating that process and methodology for, for basically you, what you do to help automate some of the workloads and provision some of this. Um, now, when I say it's easy to use, understand the tool itself is easy to use. 
But the planning that goes into how do you do something in, inside of Orchestrator, that's the really challenging and difficult part. How do you actually create your own mind map in a way that a, t a piece of software can understand it? So for example, what if you wanted to create a process to restart a server? Well, there's actually one task for that. What if you wanted to create a process that not only restarted the server, then also verified all the hard drives and hard drive controllers came up, as well as the applications and all the services that came up? And then if it didn't come up, what would you do to handle that? That's what Orchestrator will do, but you have to program it that way. You have to tell it all that methodology and process. Then you have one of the hidden gems inside of System Center, and that's DPM, or Data Protection Manager. Um, if you have ever done a save instead of a save as on a file, and if you have ever said, dang, I need to get that file back, and you right-clicked on the file and said, show me previous versions, um, that's kind of what DPM does, but it does it for your entire infrastructure. So it does it for not only your files and folders like we're used to seeing, but it also does it for Exchange. It does it for SQL. It does it for SharePoint. And then, of course, it also does it for Hyper-V. It allows us to protect and dynamically access and protect our environment. So if you have System Center today, which, by the way, you can't buy these products a la carte anymore. You do buy the whole suite. So if you own System Center 2012, you own all the pieces of software you see on this page, plus Config Man, which we don't even mention on this page. Um, give DPM a trek. Um, it's actually a really slick piece of software. But today, we're here to talk about VMM. And VMM is kind of a management server that sits in the beginning, and we have a library, we have a SQL server that stores us, we have a console, and we have all of our virtualization hosts that sit out there. You can provide HA for VMM, an app controller will know how to talk into it, but you can provide HA to VMM by simply clustering the management servers, by simply clustering the software just like we would anything else. This is how we can get that kind of vCenter heartbeat to make sure that it's there and available for us to use and leverage. But once again, we still have that console. So Underneath the covers, what does VMM do for us? What does Virtual Machine Manager do? So we have a management server. This is the one where we can go in um, and take a look at the VMs. We can provision VMs. We can take a look at the networkings. We can configure the storage. It's the one that handles everything that kind of happens uh, inside of our environment. We have a management console. Um, this can be run remotely. This can be run on the VMM server. Um, it all depends on what you want to do and how you want to manage your environment. But a big component of this is the database. And the database server contains a lot of different components of the configurations, uh, the maintenance, and the, and the different things of your virtualization environment. Then there's the library server. And let me tell you what, folks, this is probably one of the greatest things inside of here. Um, this is kind of like your big, giant bucket of Lego bricks. So if you have that big, giant bucket of Lego bricks at home, is it organized at all? Probably not. It's like you just this big, giant mound of Lego. Um, what you can do here in the library, though, is provision a lot of different things. Inside the library, this is where you store your templates, your hard drives, your floppy disks, your ISO images, your scripts, your hardware and operating system profiles, your stored VMs. What are these, folks? These are your building blocks or your Lego bricks for your private cloud or for your environment, for your virtualization environment. That library server holds it all. What's great about this is you can pick and choose which ones you actually want to use or not use. You don't have to use all of them to get functionality or uh, uh, use from VMM. So we have those types of capabilities. So if it just did that, that would be great. But VMM even takes us a step further. We actually can control with updates, with update services, as you saw briefly earlier today. But we also have the ability to control the underlying fabric or underlying backbone of your environment. And if you think about our background, what is our backbone of any virtualized environment? We have our hosts and our host clusters that we install agents on, and that's how they communicate back to VMM. We have our storage. Uh, how do we monitor and maintain our storage? And then we also have our networks and our network devices. VMM can help you manage all of this. And this is one thing, folks, If you it, since you've gotten into virtualization and, and tried it, um, virtualization has made us kind of get out of our comfort zone as IT professionals. Think if you were just a pure IT server person where all you build servers and maintain servers, that was great, right? That's all we had to worry about. But what did virtualization make us do? Learned, made us learn more about storage, made us learn more about networking devices. VMM simply provides a way in a console to get in to work with any of those topics. Now, when I get into the demo, I am going to focus on the library side of those things, but understand a lot of the underlying fabric, especially with the storage. And, and, and Tommy showed you earlier today about storage spaces and storage pools and how they're created. It's just a matter of bringing them into VMM and understand how that fabric works. But it, it would work the same way if I was bringing in some kind of uh, remote storage device or something else that might be in my network. So when we look at this, 
understand this is where we can get to kind of everything for your private cloud and it becomes kind of almost that single pane of glass for everything that we do. And I saw a question inside there, and I, I couldn't figure out how to do it, and I'm sure it's there or I'm missing it or it's not there. Uh, there are going to be some things that you can't do in VMM that you think would be there. And, and I think replication is one of them, although Tommy and I are not 100% positive because we're still trying to track it down. But for some reason, there's going to be sometimes tools you might have to hop into Hyper-V Manager to maintain or work with. So we all have this, and at the end of the day, they allow us to provision our virtual guests in our environment. They allow us to provide that private cloud kind of environment. But understand to me, when I think about private cloud, this does not mean all these resources are on premise. You might have storage, or you might have backup that's being done into a, a public cloud, like Azure for example. So understand that VMM knows how to do all this, but System Center knows how to do all this. System Center doesn't really care necessarily whether it's a virtual server, a physical server, or somewhere in a cloud, a public cloud, or a private cloud server. It's going to help us give us abilities to manage and maintain those environments as well. So let me go ahead and hop into my demo one last time here, and let's take a tour of some of the things that we can actually do uh, inside of uh, VMM for us to work with. So I'm going to give it a second to connect. So when you think about this, right now I'm, I'm in, VMM is actually organized uh, in five kind of different main areas. And over here on the lower left hand side we have VMware services, uh, we have fabric and library. Those are the where you'll spend most of your time. Uh, the other two at the bottom, and one you may just be able to see the top of it is jobs. Uh, whenever you create something inside of VMM or do something, it provisions a job. So when you create a VMM, a job is run, that's where you can go and see the running status. And the setting is where you can go in to control the different aspects of VMM. Uh, what's nice about VMM is we have fully delegated role-based uh, role and user-based access. So if you're familiar with how kind of um, a SharePoint works today, when you log into a SharePoint environment, your portal looks like based on whatever permissions you have inside that environment. Well, inside of VMM, we have the same kind of ability. So we can actually give the VMM console to certain types of users without giving them the whole uh, look and feel of our environment, maybe just allow them to do things that we want them to do without having to have maybe App Controller involved. Where our journey kind of starts today is inside of VM and, uh, VMs and services. Now, right now, I'm just seeing a general overview of what's happening. So I get a general idea of performance, how much memory is being used, uh, any monthly averages that I might have, I won't really have a lot of data, but I get some general idea of the overall health of all of my hosts. If I want to go in a specific one and take a look at maybe Hyper-V1, like I just clicked on here, I can drill into those specific types of things. Well, one of the nice things about this is if I want to add in other hosts, I can simply right-click on Add Hosts, and it gives me the ability to choose uh, Zen servers or VMware uh, hosts, uh, whatnot. Now, uh, just a point of order, uh, VMM does require vCenter, so if you want to bring in your VMware host to manage in this tool, you first need to bring in your vCenter. Now, if you've used Virtual Machine Manager in previous versions and try to manage VMware with it, um, the experience from what I hear from customers was not that great, and in part because VMM tried to do all the work on the host directly. Um, whereas now, how it works, it actually works through vCenter. So when you manage things inside of VMM and send instructions, it sends them to vCenter, which then in turn sends them to the hosts to complete whatever task you're having it do. So we have the ability to add those different hosts. We can organize them into host groups if you want to you know, have a production group versus test and dev or VMware versus Hyper-V versus Citrix, whatever. It's all there. But like all good Microsoft products, we have a ribbon, and the ribbon is kind of your key to information. So they have the show category. So if I just want to see the VMs that are running, I can see the VMs. I can see any uh, availability sets that might be happening there. Uh, I can see the services that may be running. I don't have anything currently. I don't have anything currently in VM networks. But this show option up here kind of gives you that ability to see what's going on. Now, where all the magic starts to happen is inside the VM environments. But notice the create kind of never went away. So if I need to create a virtual network, I can do that. If I want to create a private cloud, which just becomes essentially a bucket of resources for me to use, or if I just want to create a virtual machine or even convert a virtual machine, I have those abilities here. So I'm just going to choose Create Virtual Machine. I want to step you through just a couple of the, uh, the things that are here. Now I'm going to ignore the template conversation for just a moment. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. But if I say Create a Virtual Hard Drive, I can click on It's going to give me what name do I want. Let's call it Demo 2. Uh, or demo one, what generation of virtual machine do I want to create? And then I get into my configuration hardware. And this is the same that we saw earlier, but I also can tell what compatibility do I want. Is this going to be a virtual machine that runs just on Hyper-V? 
Um, is it a virtual machine that can run on VMware or Zen server? I have to kind of tell it which one am I thinking for this virtual machine for this particular option. I can even bring in, if I had other settings, I could bring in default uh, configuration settings, or I could bring in my lab settings if I had those as well. And the rest is just a matter of telling it where I want to go. So I'm just going to say Hydro-V server. Uh, I'm going to change one small thing. I'm just going to make my drive small so I can get some compatibility. And it's going to ask what destination. I'm just going to say, uh, just show me all hosts. And it should come up and show me, based on what I have currently configured, we actually have some uh, dynamic uh, provisioning going on in the back. Well, it's not provisioning yet, but some basic what's happening here is, it says, based on your environment, here are the servers where you can run this virtual machine. Based on its hardware needs that we've given it, or anything else, it's going to give us this placement. It's called a logical or a, a dynamic placement service that happens under the covers. It allows us to choose. Now, once again, I'm not actually doing an automated provisioning right now. I'm just doing one by hand. And if I, at any time, I can click on any of these virtual machines and say, give me a rating explanation. Why does this uh, meet it or why doesn't it meet it? It's going to tell me what's going on uh, inside there so I can choose the host that I want to run on intelligently. So VMM from the very, very get-go helps um, helps us place the VMMs in places that are where they're going to be the most healthy. Now, I had a question in the queue and I answered. Uh, one of the things that we do is we actually do dynamic resource allocation like VMware does through what is called dynamic optimization. So we actually can do the same kind of things where we can move workloads and make sure that they're running on the most efficient or the most healthy systems as we go through it. And as I proceed through this, I can go through uh, specifying any networks or locations where I want to store it. It's all there, but for the most part, I'm just going to go ahead and cancel out, but I wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like when you create virtual machines inside of VMM. It's a little different than just Hyper-V Manager. It gives us a little bit more flavor, a little more control uh, of what happens, and a little bit more placement of, of where we might actually put the virtual machine. We're not tied to a specific one. But what makes VMM really, really nice um, is the library here. I want to start with the library because I want to show you a couple things here because we have about eight minutes, seven minutes left now uh, before the end of our day and our time together. But inside the library, there's a couple very important concepts we have to kind of get our heads around. Understand what the library is. It's our Lego bricks. It's our building blocks. It's the environment where we build everything inside for our virtualization environment from our cloud to our things, uh, to our servers, to our applications. Well, inside of here, notice we have this concept called profiles. And inside our profiles, we have several profiles that are hardware profiles. We have a lab hardware profile. And if I look at it, it's all the different profiles I can bring in when I start creating virtual systems, um, any dependencies they may have, uh, any access issues, who can actually use this profile. So throughout this, we have security. Appl application profile. So if I look at the SQL pro uh, profile that's here, um, I can actually get into the application configuration and understand all the different things that are happening for SQL. So how does this work? Well, understand what, what's inside of a VM. Well, VM starts with hardware. Then we have an OS. Then we have applications that run on top of that OS. VMM can configure that all the way from soup to nuts. Um, and we can create these templates to help us do that. So if we want a database or a SQL or Oracle um, or a guest OS, we have those different profiles to help make that definition of what we can actually put inside of here. So if I create a guest OS profile, um, and I'll just give it a name so I can get to the next screen. And Guest OS, I now can come in and start giving it identity information. By the way, if you want to have, uh, you know, if I want to say VM, notice if I go VM pound pound, it's going to auto increment those numbers for me. Um, it, depending on the, the, the operating system I have, I have a choice of OSs that I actually bring this in. Uh, and then I'm just going to leave it on the server OS because this is where it gets kind of cool. Um, I can do admin pass. I can also do what roles are installed. So I actually see all the, the, the server roles that are ability for to install, what features that are installed. Uh, so one of my fun ones is down here at the bottom. Uh, those of you that have test environments and have uh, you know your laptop in your servers and wonder why your wireless doesn't work, uh, with Windows Server 2008 R2, the wireless feature was not installed by default. By checking that little box that says wireless LAN server, on your servers, it'll install the components uh, for your wireless networking to work on your server. So if that's driven you nuts for a couple of years, I'm sorry, but there's the answer. Uh, we can do things like domain workgroup and join that give us the ability to set up the domain, what credentials. We can even create a run as account, so we might have a, a delegated account in our Active Directory that's just for domain joins. We can bring this all in to VMM. Why is that important? Well, understand. 
that even if I just had the profiles by themselves, that's going to save me time when I build my virtual servers. But what happens when we put all these profiles together? And you can do that. You create what is known as a template. And the templates just become another logical step. Now, you don't have to do any of this. You can just create the profiles or just create one profile, not the other profiles. But the templates allow us to combine all those together. And if I look at, um, I'll look at the data tier here real quick just so you can see what it looks like. And I go into properties of the data tier. Notice it has all the different hardware configuration. It has the OS configuration for me. It has the application configuration. It's basically a combination of all those different profiles put together in one thing that I can deploy from. Because when I go in and create VMs, I have the ability to choose a template. You saw that choice in the beginning. Uh, what template would you like to use? And it gave me the ability to pick a template. And it would choose from the templates that I have created for this. But this is where VMM takes it even another step and kind of almost bams it. You know, if you're an Emerald fan, uh, you know what I'm saying. It takes it one step further. So we now have these templates. But in reality, when we deploy VMs, do we deploy just normally a single VM that just does one thing? Well, maybe. But chances are you're going to deploy some kind of application that requires maybe a front end and a back end. Maybe it's a web server and a SQL back end for it to work with it. Well, this is where we have a concept inside of VMM called service templates. And what service templates is, it's a combination of multiple templates to solve a problem, to create an application. And essentially, it becomes our way to help provision a, a, a multi-tier application. But here's where the power is, folks. What if I were just to give somebody, uh, through App Controller, which I can do, a service template to deploy an application? They wouldn't have to go through the weeds of the hardware profiles or the individual VM templates. It's based on what I've done and I've created my library. So let me show you what this looks like. So I have a service template. Um, I'm actually going to create a service template just so I can show you what this looks like um, at the very get-go. So here I am in my service template. I'm going to create one. It actually opens up a thing called the template designer behind the backgrounds. And we have the ability to make a single machine template if we want, a two-tier application, or a three-tier. I'm just going to choose a two-tier application. Click OK, and it's going to lay it out for me inside of my servers for me to use. And it tells me first tier versus second tier. And I could add in the web tiers um, if I wanted. So like maybe um, I have my uh, uh, data tier is going to be my second tier. I can simply drag this. Now what are these folks? These are just templates. These are just your templates that you have. You simply drag them over here and say, that's my second tier. And then I drag my web tier, and now I've just provisioned that environment. Now I'm still quite not there yet. I still have to set up my network connectivity. Um, and by going into the properties here, I can actually do this. And notice, it even tells me I, I don't have any templates. So it's actually validating my, against my design um, that I have for this. Go into the properties here. You'll see what's interesting about this template design. Hopefully. It only works when it works. Come on, template. When I go into this template design, then I can come into the hardware configuration. And why was I getting that error? It was the network adapter was not connected to any virtual network that I may have in my uh, platform. So I'm going to use my development LAN uh, VM environment and classify it. And also just make this uh, bandwidth low. It doesn't need a lot of bandwidth for it to use. And what will happen here is when I OK all this, it will fix that issue that I have in my template and now tell me that these are connected. And I can save and validate this template um, that I can use for other environments. So I've already done that. I've already created one template here. Let me actually just show you the properties of this. Because, oh, nope, sorry, wrong one. Let me actually show you the designer of this. So let me just right click on it and say open designer. And notice for this one, I just put my VM template in there. I set the networking up. But here's where it gets fun is I can say, let's configure this deployment. We'll just call this test three or whatever I'm up to now. Um, deploying it in the all host group. It's going to give it a second. And it's going to come up with what my template currently looks like. Now, right now, it doesn't have anything assigned. Notice it hasn't found. It says no suitable host. Well, when you first come in to configure and deploy this template in the service, you want to refresh the preview. And if everything's working right and the demo guides are with me today, notice it actually comes up and says, hey, based on the requirements for this, I can put this on host uh, two uh, for my one template and, and host one. So it knows how to split this. And then it's just a matter of me going in and clicking on deploy. And guess what happens? It's fully going to deploy this environment for me. Now imagine if you gave that to App Controller on a self-service portal where a developer can say, hey, I need to deploy my web application um, that's there. With essentially one click, they can fully provision their employed environment. So VMM can take you from the very basics of just individual profiles to, to templates to service templates. And when you put it all together, you get a lot of magic happening 
uh, under the covers. Now, granted, is there a lot of work to build all those profiles and build those OS profiles? Yeah, that's where it is. But once you spend the time to build that, you're then good to go pretty much from the, from the, from the get-go. So I'm going to go ahead and hop back. Um, I do want to just wrap up um, and, and, and first off, uh, thank everyone uh, that can hear my voice for attending uh, the, the, the camp today with us and hanging out with uh, Tommy and I as we went through this and listening to uh, Tommy's cloudy thoughts while he was talking in his pantry. I also want to send a special thanks uh, uh, to uh, uh, Brian and Young and Janelle for doing all the questions and answers and we're going to stick around and answer some questions here in a second. But folks, I, I can't thank you enough for just letting Tommy and I come in here and, and, and we're privileged to be able to talk to you about our technologies. And thank you to Eric and Julianne in the background for being there to support this. So Tommy, I'll let you. Any uh, closing words? Uh, no, I'm good. I uh, I really enjoyed everything today. I'm going through all these questions and um, you know, there are a lot of great questions here. Um, <clears throat> you know, keep in mind that you can also use the TechNet forums for any questions you may have, uh, or go ahead and you know send them over to Matt and I or anybody on our team. Um, those at the evangelist are across the country. Uh, we do events, we do training, we do uh, user group meetings and such. So um, that's what we're here for. And uh, if we don't know the answer, we'll find somebody who does. And uh, you know, hope everybody comes back and checks us out on the next edition of this. So thank you.